Okay, we're recording. Good. Um, lots of us, most of us, I could probably say, are really looking forward to our in-person worship services. I mean, we really would like them on a weekly basis. And a place to gather and be with our friends. At the same time, we recognize we need to maintain our virtual cap capabilities to reach those who are unable to attend in person. So our initial numbers for our July 2022 and June to June 2023 budget, which was created by our finance committee with a lot of work from the finance committee, reflect that incorporating, reflect, Anyway, incorporating plans to double our in-person services, multi-platform worship services, and in-person faith development to two Sundays a month in September, followed by a move into a rental space available 24 seven in January to support a weekly worship, faith development uses, meetings, offices, that sort of thing. This last move we envision as similar to what we had in 595. And we have encountered a teensy problem, cost. As we were aware, even when we were at 595, the cost was difficult for us to, actually at that point, it was impossible for us to sustain. So we're going to have Britt and Rob, mostly Britt, who is our finance chair, uh, present options, other options for our in-person in -person worship and faith development and how that impacts our budget. So Britt, are you ready to take it away? Um, sure, except it looks like I'm not able to share my screen at the moment. <laughs> oh, we need to make you a co-host. Yes, now you're a co-host. Okay. So this first information I'm actually is Kip on because uh, this actually touches on the uh, annual pledge drive. Yeah, Kip is here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Yes. Okay, Kip. I, hopefully, it's fairly self-explanatory, but take it away. Well, we have been running a, a pledge drive all through March, and right now we are at about $162,000. There's a bunch of folks out there who have not responded yet for multiple reasons. Some of them have never given. Some of them are new. Some, we don't know if they still think they love us, but what we see is what we God, I would guess there's another 10 grand out there on top of this that is real when some people go home and said, oh, yeah, I was going to pledge. But I think we're at about 170, 175, unless somebody proves me wrong, which I invite. Okay. So moving on to the next slide. So Kathy gave you kind of a brief summary of our current situation, um, but to reiterate, we have an annual pledge drive goal, which is about a 10% increase above the current fiscal year. The current budget request is for a traditional rental. Um, really, though, I don't want to focus so much on the impact for next fiscal year because Fiscal year 2023 will be a transition year. This meeting is more about setting the congregation up for fiscal year 2024 and beyond in a financially sustainable way. Obviously, we're looking forward to purchasing our own space, but considering that the capital campaign does not end until late 2023, the absolute earliest we could probably do something is a year or so later. 
you know, considering there's going to be purchase, you know, finding stuff, negotiating the purchase price, build out, et cetera. So at least for 2024, we have to be financially sustainable. We need to show that for many reasons that we have a, a balanced budget. And we'll be fine if 2023 isn't as balanced as we would like it to be as we transition back, as long as it sets the stage for future balanced budgets. So I wanna draw your attention to the last two bullets on this slide, which I've highlighted here. The estimated annual operating cost for the traditional rental path is $325,000 or about $2,500 per adult member of this congregation. That's a huge increase in costs. Um, at, the at the current, even considering the current uh, goal for the annual pledge drive, which KIPP has sort of given us some not necessarily great news, that results in a projected deficit of $90,000. That's un unsustainable. So in, in good conscience, the Finance Committee can't submit the fiscal year 2023 budget request as is to the board and to the congregation because it just sets us up for failure. So we need your input on other options to pursue the preparation for the annual meeting and the final budget approval process in May. So here's two uh, less draconian choices, let's say. Each have caveats and requirements that in order to make them sustainable. So let's see, I have a, Kip raised his hand. So I'm asking him to unmute and speak. I raised my hand to position myself in the upper part of the of the screen, but I've finished talking. People don't need to find me anymore, and I've said my piece. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, then. Moving on. Um, church in a box is one option. We've done this before. It requires a weekly commitment of time and labor. It, it's not knowledge work, it's physical labor that we're talking about. Many of us have done this in the past. Um, it's similar to what we did at Central Park Elementary School. There's still a projected deficit there, but um, assuming we managed to meet our goal of again, $22,000 for pledges, um, we think we can we think we can work around that. It still requires a, either a bit more increase in pledges or cuts in expenses, but we've worked around that before in the past. Um, you need to consider these projected deficits as likely midpoints of a variety of reasonable options. The second choice is a one room meeting house choice. That we've never done before. Again, it requires a weekly commitment, but it's a different sort of commitment because we probably have to be uh, doing things sequentially. So for example, faith development, then we reconfigure the space for worship. Then we reconfigure the space for hospitality. But this would be a 24 seven full-time rental. Um, it's going to be significantly smaller than what we had at 595 Park of Commerce, but it would be available 24 7. So we'd have it available during weekdays, evenings, Saturdays. Whereas with the church in the box, the only thing we have 24 7 is a small space for our offices and maybe maybe meeting room or rooms. We would rent the large space each Sunday for faith development and worship services, probably running in parallel similar to what we did at 595 Park of Commerce. 
Again, there's a projected deficit. But again, this is a midpoint of likely options. So there's possibly some increase in pledges or cuts in expenses. But again, I want to emphasize this is assuming we actually meet our annual pledge drive goal. So are there any questions about these options? Um, I can't really see, like if you're physically raising your hand, I can't see it. If you can use your... Aaron's got his hand up. Okay, Aaron. Hi, Brett. Um, I had a question and I wanted to clarify something. These papers have been using the term one room meeting house, but I, I feel like it's misleading. We were discussing 1,200 to 1,500 square feet, which is large enough for a lar relatively large meeting room, like 30 by 40 feet, plus three to four office spaces. So I want, unless something changed. Well, you said, so 30 by 40, um, I had all the numbers in the part, square feet. So then it must have been, I had all the numbers in the early email when we were discussing it. So then it must have been smaller than that. But we did between 12 and 15, we figured we could have a, a, a decent sized room large enough for 40 or 50 people. Yes. I'd have to go back and find those numbers. They're not in front of me. But we Plus, probably would only have space for one secured lockable office space okay. on top of that. I thought it would be more like two or three, but still, it's not. We're not really talking about one room. There are multiple yeah, okay. possibilities for which all the which, meeting. The meeting place is basically one room. The office would have to mostly be be remain locked, except when it's in use, because it contains right. confidential information, um, access to our electronic files as well as physical files, and okay. and money. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry that I don't have those numbers in front of me. It had to do, it was back when we were discussing this with the finance committee, um, as far as the yeah. space allocation. But I do think there was enough room for a decent sized space and at least three office spaces, one of which could be faith development. So my main thing was like faith development, as long as it's the size it is, would probably be okay in, in one of those office spaces. We wouldn't have to um, reconfigure. And hospitality is nothing but a table with coffee and drinks. So there's no huge reconfiguring there. Well, we, we, we went back and refigured some stuff and there were things that we hadn't considered, such as the fact that um, the impact of, we hadn't properly configured the impact of um, utilities and some other things. And so we went back and reconfigured and we're talking probably closer to 1,100 square feet total. Okay. Yeah, we had hoped we might be talking about 500 square feet for offices and meeting rooms and then a large meeting house, but mm -hmm. just didn't work out when we actually ran the numbers in more detail. Okay. So sorry. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have questions? If, if you use the raise hand option, um, then you'll, you'll pop up and I'll be able to see you. But otherwise I can't see your faces because all I see is the Bruce Snow. Yeah, okay, great. Bruce. Bruce. Um, my question is, why does the 24-7 the space cost less than the church in a box? Okay. Good question. I'm going to actually pop over to the next um, slide. We ran the numbers and part of it is because, you know, a lot of these utilities and stuff like that um, get folded into the rental expense. But part of it is just because we're actually talking about significantly more space if we want to do faith development at the same time as worship. So we're also paying for the space, but it's just, you know, people who do this sort of, who rent out on an occasional basis such as this, don't necessarily run lean. They don't necessarily always expect to be 
renting this stuff out. We might be able to negotiate something less. And in fact, we're hoping we can. As I said, this is a likely midpoint, but if we can reduce costs for one way or another, that, that would be great. Um, still, you know, I, what I wanna emphasize is I think we can do either of these as long as we hit our um, annual pledge drive goal. If we don't even hit that, it makes it that much more difficult. Right. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Anybody else have questions? Three participants raised hands. Okay. Uh, for some reason, it's not popping up in order. Um, let's see, who's got their hand raised? I, I do, maybe you can't see it. Oh, right. now I see it, oh, okay. <laughs> um, in looking at both of these proposals, you know, I'm thinking of my own pledge and I can meet the pledge of both of these. I think what we all have to recognize is that um, this takes a lot of energy on a Sunday morning and for those of us who've done Church in a Box before, we have to be really conscious when we make these decisions that either you're able to step up and help or we're going to have to talk about how we do this. So I think that has to be uppermost in our mind of the commitment on Sunday morning to arrange space, take it up, put it down and, and, and be there. So I, I throw that out to everyone to think about their, not only financial commitment, but their Sunday morning commitment. Yes, that, that's definitely true. All of these will take some sort of commitment. It's a different, it's probably a different type of commitment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the church in a box is, is something we've done before, so we know it better, but, um, you know, you probably, we have to have people there maybe an hour or more ahead of time to set things up. Uh, it involves a lot of rerunning of cables for sound and things like that, that if you had a 24 seven facility, we could set in place and forget. But the set in place facility requires us to probably react a lot quicker and faster and maybe a lot more hands on deck to get the reconfigurations done. Okay, Dan, I see you have your hand up. And you're muted. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, hi, <laughs> and I was muted. Um, you kind of have already spoke to one of my questions, which is uh, with these two options or any option, it, what the capability as we look at space is for being able to leave stuff on site or leave it set up because for exactly what we were talking about is that it takes, especially since we have a usually a, a pretty very musical service and just moving all that sound equipment, you know, in and out. And I remember when we were at Central Park, we had to bring up, you know, the piano in and I mean, it was a, it was a huge amount of labor. So if that's being taken into um, account, and as Rita said, it then requires other people to have the energy to go and set it up. Uh, and I also like Karen's suggestion in the chat that maybe when we ask people about pledging, we also ask them how much of their own time uh, that they're willing or able, because in some cases people just can't. And I appreciate that. And the other thing I was going to mention or ask about is when we're talking about faith development classes and being able to reconfigure rooms and do things, one of the things we always have to remember though is um, the whole noise and the privacy factor. Um, you know, we found that out even with our lovely rental space on 595 when we had that nice big room for a class next door, if it got too rowdy, during the service, um, it was pretty clear what was going on in the other room. So sometimes reconfiguring space, although faith development's done it before and they can do it again, um, those challenges have to be kept in mind. Thank you. Turn your sound down. Turn it oh. Okay. 
Um, thank you, Diane. That that is true. Um, so I'm yeah. I flash back to the other one. I, I do want to emphasize. You know, this requires a weekly commitment. And um, as we get to the end here, I'm going to kind of lay out some paths forward so we will get your feedback uh, in different ways on this. Um, yes, all of us would love to have something in the meantime until we get our permanent home that is like 595 Park of Commerce. Um, and if we, if we have the money, we can do it. We just at the moment don't have the money, but there are other possibilities that are currently being pursued. Keep in mind, this isn't, we aren't expecting this to be, we aren't a long-term solution. The long-term solution, as we laid out back when we were in Park uh, 595, Park of Commerce, is to obtain our own facility. And that's why we started the capital campaign. All right, uh, Susan Hunukosa, or worship chairperson as you are named here. Oh, sorry, I need to read <laughs> um, My, uh, I just wanted to bring up that if we're talking about church in a box, uh, we had it before in a school. And um, one of the things I have found out is that if you want to um, have something in a school, you must get permission um, from the principal. And um, that's the public schools. And I would assume that's the same for the charter and the private schools. And uh, so we got to have an in with somebody because a lot of them don't want to deal with it. Um, other than that, I don't know who, where you are thinking about doing church in a box. Well, that we don't have any particular ideas at the moment. We have a lot of ideas, but none of them are very fully formulated. Um, I can address that a little bit. Ken, okay, go ahead. And then Gary's up next. Okay, sorry to move in on you, Gary. So a um, couple of no, places that were, say again? Go ahead. <laughs> no, you're not. Um, uh, one of the places, we've been looking at a number of different places. Uh, Susan is absolutely right. Every principal uh, negotiates on their own. Um, if anyone knows a principal or a, an administrator, um, let me know. Uh, we do have a relationship with someone who is in Sagemont School in Weston. We're talking about uh, talking to them. Um, I'm also looking at something that uh, someone gave us a lead for at um, Flamingo Park. And uh, it comes with audio visual and, and uh, everything, but it, uh, and it came with some storage and some kitchen at, a, at an incredible low price, but it came with no RE kind of opportunities. So we're going to go meet with them on Monday, and they, they were telling me that there are a number of other uh, facilities that we might want to be interested in. So those are uh, buildings at parks that are community centers um, that may fit our needs, and, and anything is, that, that we look at is going to check off some of the blocks and not other blocks but we're looking to maximize everything, if that helps a little. Thanks, Ken. Okay, go ahead, Gary. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that we do have experience with a one room meeting house in, in some sense. And uh, it's for, you know, once a month, part of the year back when we were at 595, and that's the cafe setup and breakdown. Um, Good point. And that, that happened incredibly quickly, right? So we would need to figure out how to uh, leverage the congregational resources to create that same instantaneous you know, transfer that happens at the end of a cafe. Before the cafe is a little more involved, but it doesn't take that long because I've been a part of that as well. So that's just something to keep in mind. We do have experience with it. We're very good at it. It happens very quickly. Um, with enough hands. Yes. 
the, the key part is enough hands and getting the regular commitment to have yeah. those hands available. Yeah. I, I would like to point out also, uh, you're right. Um, and I think Karen's idea was a, a very good one is that, um, it's a real bonding experience. It's another form of, uh, enhancing our bonds as a community. It, you know, it seems like when you think about it, it's kind of how I feel about writing. I dread the thought of writing when I'm actually writing, I kind of enjoy it, you know, and that's the thing about setting up. It's, it's a bonding experience for those who do it and it's not drudgery. It can be fun. All right. Thank you. Uh, Aaron, you're up next. Thanks. I'll try to keep it brief because I already spoke. So I used to set up the sound at Central Park and I've already told people I can't do it again. Um, uh, to Gary's point, I know what you mean, Gary. Um, tearing down after the concert was kind of fun. We did it in 10, 15 minutes. Usually a lot of the concert goers would help. Setting up something more technical um, is different than that. Um, it took me an hour to an hour and a half before Central Park to set it up. I was usually almost alone in setting it up. It was very heavy. And one of the problems with doing it when you're doing something like that is it's a, talk about equipment. You have to be there. No one else can do it very often or no one else will do it. So it becomes a real problem. Like, you know, if I were to say, well, I'll do it once in a while. Who well, I, what I'm trying to say is you're either doing it every week or you're not <laughs> with a thing like that. It's um, that was my experience at Central Park. Um, my only other thing that I wanted to express, which I've been doing in all the meetings, to me, having our own space is a hundred percent, a totally different experience than walking into um, church in a box. You know, you decorate it, you make it feel the way you want to feel, you set up the gear. The gear is always there when you need it. Um, it just feels more like home. It's a place to go, whereas a Sunday only space doesn't do any of that. And I don't think it serves our real needs. Um, Zoom no longer serves our needs. It, it worked. We It had to work. We had no choice for a year and a half. But now it's not, you know. Um, people go to church for connection, human connection. That's the biggest reason. And Zoom does not really do that. Um, and I think having a, a real home is really important. You know, a rent, a rental, obviously we can't afford to buy. And I'm not sure that we are talking about a short term solution. Um, we've looked at the price of real estate and although it sounds like we have a lot of money in the bank, we don't have near enough apparently. So renting might not be that short term a solution. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, um, it's definitely true. We don't know what our time frame is to be in here, which is another reason why this is an important decision right now. Um, we need to be able to set us up for something that we don't really know how much we need to, how long we're going to be in it, but we need to make sure it's something we can support both financially and in terms of time and labor. Um, Okay, so Ellie's up next, and then Ketchy, and then Kathy is up. Okay, I need a little clarification, please. I fully know what Church in the Box is, and I think that's the biggest pain in the butt and not really good for the bonding <laughs> side. But I don't understand in the one-room meeting house, if we have a designated area for the office with a locked door, what are we taking up and putting down? Okay, so what we are doing is we need to provide the same services that we currently are doing. So we have to be able to support faith development. We have to be able to support worship service. We have to be able to support hospitality. We also have to be able to support regular meetings if we in person. So each of those, if what we have is essentially a locked office, which has to mostly remain locked, and one big room, 
in order to support all those, we can't have them happening all at once. So you have to do it sequentially. So if you're gonna have Sunday morning faith development, you're doing that separate at a separate time than your Sunday morning worship service. If you have hospitality, you're obviously doing that at a separate time. The room has to be reconfigured in some way to support each of that in a relatively small space. So that's what the setup and teardown. And that's why Gary alluded to, we have some experience with something similar when we transitioned from a setup of the um, cafe into worship service setup for the next morning. Um, we did it very quickly. It obviously won't be the same, but it's the type of effort and work that needs to be done to do the reconfigurations. Okay, so the sanctuary area of 595, do we know what the square footage of that was? Um, Oh, I had it. Uh, I I know it. I mean, I can look it up, but I don't know it off the top of my head. It was 000. approximately eighteen hundred square feet, I believe. The sanctuary itself was that size. Yeah, not with the so. office rooms and stuff. No, that was that office area was like twenty two hundred square feet. Oh, uh, that probably also includes bathrooms. Um, and then uh, the remaining was the kitchen and the lobby area, essentially. So, so yes. we're talking about going down at least 600 square feet just for service? Mm -hmm. Probably smaller because we still, that 1,200 square feet would probably, you know, maybe the maximum we get, and that includes the locked office and a bathroom. So yeah, it'll be challenging. But then we don't know how many will start coming. You know, we may have to adjust other approaches. There are many things that we may have to do. You know, some people, some people may still choose to attend via Zoom. So, did that answer your question? Pretty much so. Okay. Uh, we got Ketchy, and then I guess Kathy dropped out. So Bev is next, and then Gary again. Ketchy. Okay. So um, the one room meeting house, if we were to adopt this model, would we also be able to rent the space? Because though I understand the need for reconfiguring, what I, you know, what I hear is that there's Throughout the week, there could be a lot of movement of chairs, but it's only on Sundays that you would have, you know, a more elaborate situation. But it would really just be moving chairs during the week for covenant groups or for different meetings that are going on. Um, so would it be possible to rent the space to another group on, say, Tuesday or a Thursday, um, you know, with a message that we agree, believe in, etc., that could drive up some of the income to help support the space? Um, yep, that's a possibility, and that might be one of the options to make up the de projected deficit. So um, it could also, if we in increased our contributions, which I think a lot of people, for example, I have had trouble finding the link online, so I will say I have not pledged, but of course I will pledge. Um, so I think maybe there are others like me, um, but could that also make it so that we could get a larger space? So if we're, you know, sharing, you know, not sharing, but if we are um, renting the space out to other small groups and we find the right deal because there's other groups that want to meet and, you know, real estate the way that it is, um, this could provide an opportunity. We could use that to actually get a slightly larger space we could, when we needed um, it or if we needed to yeah. somehow expand this. But I don't, we would not really be able to make that choice without knowing who those other groups are ahead of time. I mean, once, you know, we, we could say, we'll probably have to lease for at least a year, let's say. So if it, it turns out that we do get additional groups who are interested, 
then perhaps we could look into changing leases. You know, we're always going to be have the potential, but again, the more often you change leases, the less benefit you have of having a permanent a permanent location. You then have to move to the new space. You have to rewire everything, et cetera, and we can, you know, reset it up. So there's a balance there. No, I think this is a permanent um, solution. I had just one last question because I, I really um, I appreciated Ellie's question about square footage. How large is the space we're currently meeting in? Because I think that we don't need quite as much meeting space because we will have people joining us by Zoom. Um, and I think it's reasonable to assume that every person doesn't show up every time. Uh, so the the very large gatherings that where we have more participation um, would only be that those would be the only challenging times. Um, so how large is the space that we have right now um, when we meet occasionally? So the, the, the monthly one, uh, Rob, do you know? Uh, I don't know the exact square footage on it. I know that it's uh, for the fire uh, rating, it's, it's, it allows um, individual seating without a table or without tables um, of about 70 people. So to exactly. Ketchy's point, you can get a lot of people in there, but you know we've had to cut down on that because of the restrictions. So okay, so but I can, I can look about, it up for you. It's usually about 15 square foot, I believe, per person in a, just an assembly type organization. Gary might know better, actually. Um, but so if you do the math there, I suppose 70 people's it, it's. I don't know, close to about 1100 1, square feet. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just getting a feel. But that but that was just the the meeting space and then you you add the bathrooms and the service area it'd be yeah, that would that's probably a good way of looking at that space or something like sure. for those of us that did church in a box at toddler tech, I, it's probably similar to that. Maybe maybe a little bigger than that. Yeah, and keep in mind also um, you can't use the entire allowable space because you have to sort of have the worship area up front. Absolutely. Um, Good point. So, but, you know, it can be reconfigured in a variety of ways. I mean, the, the fire code basically limits the total amount of people because of egress, not because how close they are <laughs> to each other. Uh, Bev, I see you're next, and then Gary, and then David or Elise. <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, I'm definitely against Church in a Box. I remember that from Central Park, and it was, I thought it was horrible. Um, no, the setup and teardown was not fun, and we ran into problems because we were in somebody else's space and they weren't happy with what we were doing in it. Uh, I personally do not have any problem with continuing with a hybrid Zoom, you know, that uh, meeting and uh, while at the same time having the Zoom option. But then I'm, I'm a hermit, I don't really, feel the great need for human connection. But and I can understand other people feel differently. Um, just I'm just letting you know, uh, the number two option sounds better, certainly not perfect, but we can hope eventually we'll get our own place. Okay, you're actually jumping the gun here. We're going to be getting to that toward the end of the presentation anyway. Um, Kathy, how much time do we have to go, by the way, just as a time check? It is now 1.14. I was kind of envisioning this to go to like 1.30 because people don't generally function after about <laughs> an hour, an hour and a half meeting. So um, okay. let's focus on wrapping it up somewhere around okay. 15, 20 minutes. All right. Well, we got questions from Gary, then David or Elise, then Ken or Leanna. And uh, so if you have any more questions, hopefully get in line <laughs> quickly. Gary, go ahead. I'll defer to David and or Elise since they haven't spoken yet. Okay. Thank you, Gary. 
Uh, David or Elise? Hi, it's Elise. Um, so the, uh, the two questions, number one I had was, um, if we do the number two one room meeting, um, would the kids meet like before or after um, as opposed to simultaneous because we won't have space for them? Yes, I would believe that would probably be the, the way it would have to be. Um, okay. Unless, right. unless they chose a different day to meet even. I don't know. Okay. It all depends on how faith development wants to work it. Okay, and then the other question kind of went back to Ketchy's with the idea of doing this with another group. Um, have we been in, in touch with TAO in terms of like looking at a larger space and doing this together? Um, yes. Can I answer, we, can I, can I answer yes, that? Yes, please do, yes. Uh, yes, we have been working with TAO on purchasing, uh, you know, doing a partnership as we purchase something. Uh, they have already secured a rental for their worship service and the things that they want to do. So, um, and I think if we rented this one room, um, it probably wouldn't be large enough for what TAO wants to do. Well, um, then can't, can, do they have a space large enough for what we want to do? They're only renting it for their service. It's not their 24 seven. They just okay, have- so They're doing the church in the box. Yeah, they're doing church in the box. Okay. And, and I believe their services are on a Friday. Is that right, Kathy? Yeah, yeah. Which is how we could share it before, but um, now they have their own space because they needed, they wanted an in-person space. But mm -hmm. if we got, so if we got this, are they committed? Would they, would they be willing to switch and come join our one room meeting house on Friday nights? Or it's just not going to be big enough for them at that point? I don't know. It depends. We could approach them if we have a big enough spot um, and, and see. Um, okay. Can, I think, it for me. Um, at, hi, I don't, I don't want to interrupt because I know that people have their hands up, but I think we took, TAO took it for a year. But we are we are at the um, old schoolhouse, Davy Old Schoolhouse, um, and it is a wonderful venue. So, and I think you guys have checked it out, and I I don't know what the result was, but it's it's big enough, and um, it's not too expensive as another option. Yeah, we do have a team of people working on our our rental space. It's Ken and Karen and Pam um, to specifically focus. Now, if you have any ideas, send it to me or send it to them. Um, they'll check out everything. Um, yeah, okay. and I, I've, Old Davy Schoolhouse, it won't be available till January. Um, right. So that still makes it possibly, since we're looking to secure a space starting in January, but it seems unlikely that the person there or the, the group there is not going to continue, but we'll see. It, it, you know, everything's on the table at the moment and you got to think of this again as a potential range of a lot of different options. Um, okay, uh, Ken and Leanna, you are next. Well, yeah, actually just, I was next, I just deferred. Oh, that's right, Gary, sorry. And if it's Leanna, I'll defer again. If it's Ken, no, no way. <laughs> It yeah. can, it can. You're up, Gary. Uh, okay, okay, Gary. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to say, uh, I think Old Davy Schoolhouse would be church in a box, right? Yes. That's not what I wanted to say originally. Okay, so um, what I wanted to say about growth, uh, although this wouldn't apply to faith development, so maybe this isn't a solution, uh, but certainly as uh congregations and churches grow, uh, two services becomes a possibility to accommodate the additional growth. So the uh, that could be a possibility for us. Uh, but if the faith development program grows like it did the last time we were meeting in person, then that I don't think we'll be able to have. Uh, uh, maybe we will. That's that's up to the faith development director. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is we could have multiple uh, services and possibly space out the classes as we do on Zoom. Yep, that's definitely a possibility as well. Um, the key is that if it's our own space, that would make it easier, but it would also take reconfiguration each time. 
Well, not not necessarily for the uh, classrooms. Uh, you just have yeah, if they were sequentially, you're right. Different you students, take it over. and then not not for the services either. You you could have the hospitality time between the service. Anyway, that's we're getting into <laughs> minutia. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, Ken. Ken. Okay. Leanna said it was Ken. Ken, you're up. <laughs> So, so just for everyone's sake, uh, we have had people looking at this for almost 20, 25 years. So and like Gary said, we've got an incredible amount of knowledge within the congregation itself. And, and in looking at going at two services, yeah, you put the, the social hour in between, so you still are able to do that. For everyone's general numbers, uh, you know, the numbers you need in your hip pocket for the space we had on 595. Um, our, our sanctuary area was about 2,000 square feet. And then all of the classrooms, the storage, the kitchen, and the social area was another 3,000. So we had about 5,000. So that, that, that's kind of the, the general number for you to look at. And then when we were looking for a footprint of of land to purchase and what size of building that kind of thing we were looking at our future home of being somewhere around what 75 to 10,000 square feet no, in that neighborhood less than that starting but yeah yeah you know expandable too exactly so but the numbers for 595 2000 for the sanctuary and 5000 total now keep in mind I mean, we're not going to be able to lease anything that is already designated like that, laid out and available 24 uh, seven. They just don't exist. So we're going to have to put checks in a couple of areas of our, of our checklist. And then we're, we're gonna have to make do with the other areas and we'll figure it out. We always do. Okay, I see Bruce is up. Uh, go ahead, Bruce. Okay, real quick. Um, I just want to speak from the perspective of a young family. I think that's kind of where the growth in the church would be if, if mm -hmm. you were looking to that. And um, really, we can't do sequential faith development. Like faith development is what brings us to the church and it for us it has to be pretty much during service it makes it really inconvenient for us to do it after or before um really you know during, at the same time is is what makes it work for us and speaking from that perspective uh, if, if it's not appealing for other families with young kids to come in then then other families with kids aren't going to come in. So um, I just want you guys to keep that in mind. If we're talking about the one room thing being more appealing, uh, it, it's it's got to work for for us young families too. Understood. And um, I want to bring up one other thing uh, that will impact younger families as well. Um, a lot of us who have the experience in doing church in a box or the, or to some extent, smaller extent, one room meeting house, we lived through this when we had younger families and we're probably willing, let's say we're willing to help, but in many cases, we're not able to do the physical lifting and work that is necessary to do a one room schoolhouse type thing. Um, it, it, it can be very daunting and tough work in many cases. So this is one of those things where in a lot of cases we'll be looking at some younger families to say, yes, I can provide the muscle and I can learn how to set these things up and make the commitment to do that. Uh, to, to live with the church in the box. Um, we've also always had to make the, the choices about, do we wanna have worship at the same time as faith development? 
Uh, do we have enough teachers who are willing to forego worship service to do faith development at the same time? And, and we've had different answers during different time frames. Um, Deb uh, can probably, I see her hand up. She might be able to speak to some of this too. Deb, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was a um, faith development director of religious education during that time when we were at the elementary school. And we did have, um, I, I believe it was like, like maybe nine to 10, we had Sunday school and then 10 to 11, we had service or something like that. Let me tell you for if, if what a lot of parents did is they dropped their kids off. We did have a woman, Marta, who was our child, watched the kids for the little ones. And then the parents would go have coffee by themselves, which was a, which was a big plus. Or we had adult faith development classes just for the adults. We also had a covenant group for parents of children that met. So, and then all the Sunday school teachers were able to go to service, which was really nice. Um, it, you are there for an extra hour on Sunday morning, but um, people got a lot out of it. Um, and also, um, I think I saw somebody made a comment about the older children can also go to service if they wanted to and participate in some of the, and particularly some of the things in the beginning. And we had um, kids doing that as well, helping out with some of the things. So it, we were growing when we had uh, the linear or whatever sequential um, services. So, and we were growing when we were at um, the elementary school. So it can happen. It was, it was a tremendous amount of work during the service and the kids did sit in the service. I took them out and um, there was a playground at the elementary school and they got to just play, you know, not structured after their Sunday school class, which was a wonderful opportunity for me to get to know the kids. So uh, on a, you know, uh, informal basis. So um, it worked really well um, in a lot of ways. It takes a longer commitment on people's part on Sunday mornings, but I think they got a lot out of it. And the Sunday school teachers got to hear Rev Ken's sermons, which mm. they really wanted to do. Um, and I know uh, Sunday school teachers have a hard time missing out every Sunday on service and not getting fed spiritually from the sermons and stuff. So that's my two cents on that. Thanks, Deb. Um, Bev, you're up next and then we're running out of time. So you're going to be the last. Oh, okay. Um, I only had one year of being a Sunday school teacher. Um, I pretty much stunk at it, so you can ignore my opinion. Because I won't be doing it again. But while I was a Sunday school teacher, I really missed being able to attend services. I, you know, and I think that should be a consideration. Okay, so there's obviously a lot to consider. So moving to the next questions. Uh, okay, these are questions to ask yourself. Uh, Britt, could you yeah. um, address Melissa's question in the chat? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> general breakdown of costs based on category. All right, that would be this. So if you look at um, so our incomes up at the top, our general costs, committees and teams, it's pretty much, you know, you can see it's kept the same between the two options. The only thing that changes are operational expenses, particularly involving rental expense. Um, and then we have uh, outreach, which in part is a function of what we collect in our plate, but other things as well, and staffing, which um, I don't have the breakdown of that because that's from personnel um, and part of the independent contractors is I think a combination of worship and music. Um, 
If I can add still... something about the staffing, the personnel estimate, that is not just salary. That is insurance, that is the taxes we pay, um, and all that sort of thing thrown into that one line. So there's a yes. lot in being an employer. That's, that's total that cost line. of uh, employment. Yeah. Okay, does that answer the question? But chat? based on the current um, projection, uh, the, tr the trend that we're currently seeing, um, the what is classified or categorized as staffing, we have 20, about 20,000 above staffing, correct? If you, if, you're, um, if you said for, that we're running just under 200,000, right? Well, that's for this year. Right. Um, and right. that's not this year's staffing. That's what's projected for next year. That includes um, staffing that we, for, we did not hire for this year because we ended up being virtual. Right. Um, and it also involves cost of living adjustments for the staff. But, but Melissa, to your point, when you look at the APD for this year, which uh, Kip shared was right now projected to be about 170, 175,000, you were saying 20,000 over staffing. Oh, so at we're projected just staffing yeah. charges at 170, we are basically just meeting with our APD, the staffing charge, the predicted staffing charges. So, so one of the things we'd be looking at um, in, a, in meeting the projected deficit is potentially not hiring all the staffing that have been requested, but we'd need, we'd either need to forego the services that they'd be providing, which is difficult, or we'd have to rely on volunteers. So that's another phase, another, another phase of effort that we would need to make up for. So Again, here, kind of the questions to ask yourself to kind of hopefully encapsulate these, these things. Um, I, you know, we believe that one way or another, we can meet, assuming we get the current goal of, of the APD, either the church in a box or the one room meeting house. Um, but it requires, they both require weekly commitments of time and labor of different sorts and of different types and different categories of labor. Um, so they either require an increase in pledges above that or we cut the resources and somebody volunteers to make up the cuts. Um, so think about what you wanna do. For in-person services and faith development, how much you're either willing to increase your pledge or volunteer services to have this happen. So I'm gonna let you contemplate these questions for a few minutes, and then I'm gonna describe how we hope to receive your input on these questions. So I'll just leave these up here for now, and you can look at them and think about them, and then we'll move on and hopefully finish this out. <laughs> Sorry, we're running over. Okay, has everybody had a chance to contemplate these questions? Hearing no objection, I'm moving on. Um, 
So your input first, your annual pledge. If you haven't yet pledged for fiscal year 2023, please do so. If you have pledged, please consider whether having heard all of this, you would be willing to pledge more to make up the projected deficit. Um, you can kind of, as you heard from Kip, a pledge drive runs through next week. So please try and get your feedback in by then. Second way we're requesting your input is for you to let us know of your willingness to commit your time and labor. Please send it to Maureen Lundell at vice president at riverofgrassuu.org. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we don't have past ex a lot of past experience. Gary pointed out where we did with the one room meeting house model, but Maureen has had many years of past experience with the church in the box model. So she can discuss with you what might, what commitments might be needed, or she can point to you in the direction of somebody who can explain them a little bit better to you. Um, and I would love to get alternative ideas if people have them. Yeah, and as she just said, she would love to get alternative ideas if people have them. Then finally, I'm gonna ask, Kathy, we don't have like a poll we can throw up, but I guess we could ask them to raise their hands and we can count. We would like to get an idea of which of the two options, assuming we could go either way, which option excites you the most? Which would you really like to see us pursue if we can do both? And with that, I am going to close the screen sharing so we can hopefully see each other. Um, do you all know how to raise your hand electronically? Okay, let's hope you do. So if you would prefer that if we have the choice of going either direction, that we pursue the church in the box option, option one, please electronically raise your hand under reactions now. I don't know. So if you don't know how to raise your hand electronically, you click on reactions and at the bottom it says of the pop-up it says raise hand okay go ahead or just raise your hand <laughs> or just raise your hand and i'll rely on well you'll have to you know have your video on and i'll rely on maureen to count it for me <laughs> no i'll try and count as well Britt, I'm sorry. Can you just can you just um, clarify for me? Are we are we raising hands for? And this is Mallory, by the way. Mm -hmm. Are we raising hands for Church in a Box or One Room Schoolhouse at this moment? At this moment, Church in a Box. I see Ken and Leanna's hand raised. I see Steve Jones Rocco. I don't see Ken and Leanna's hand raised. I see a finger raised. Okay, Ken, thanks. You see one, one, not two. One, We're not in okay. agreement. All right. Chuck. Uh, Pam, Pam Kellner, Peter Fox. Okay, Peter Fox, Pam Kellner. Um, so we've got four votes for Church in a Box. If we have the option to pursue either way, Anybody else before we move on to the second option? Okay, everybody please lower their hands. Okay, please either electronically or physically with your video on, raise your hand if you want to try, if you would prefer to pursue the one room meeting house model, but that excites you the most. Where did we wow. go? <laughs> I'm, I'm not on the video. Kemp, is your clap a, a raised hand? Oh. <laughs> oh, where am I here? There. So 
You're on video, uh, Georgette. We can see your hand raised. Okay, we have, well, I don't even know if I need to count at this point, but we have 7, 14, 21, 25, 26, 27. I'm counting 28. <laughs> Anybody else? You counting 28? Well, it seems that of the people who attended this, the general consensus is they would like the excitement. Okay. They would like the excitement of pursuing the one room meeting house model. So assuming everything works out and we can afford either way, we'll pursue that one. And again, this relies on your responses to the annual pledge drive and you contacting Maureen Lundell at, oh, our video is not on, why not? Is our video now on? Yes, it's now on. At Vice President at River of Grass UU.org. I'm putting it, did I spell that right? In the chat. And I see a question if we do not meet the pledge, actually, we're talking about not meeting the pledge or the commitment of time and effort. We've got some really hard choices to make at the annual meeting. And I don't know, we may end up meeting in a park someplace under a tree. Well, I would like to thank Britt um, and hopefully continue if you could. Um, Susan, can you spotlight me? If I have Susan, maybe I can spotlight myself. There I am. Okay, thank you. Um, and those of you who have your hand up, please take them down unless you have an urgent question. <laughs> I really want to thank you all for your participation in this. This is a wonderful discussion. We got what we wanted as far as where the majority of the people here in our meeting want to proceed. And this is very helpful. And as was pointed out, we need both your time and your treasure in order to make these things happen. So, um, hey, there's a link for how to pledge in the chat now. Okay. So that seems to be an obstacle. Thank you. Thank you. All right, here's my chalice. And we're going to extinguish it. And once again, thank you. May we leave this place seeking the uncharted with courage and with a freshly chosen way to be together, knowing we have companions along the way. So, Thank you, everybody. And as I just saw a, a chat there, make it happen, please. Thank you all. Thank you, Kathy. We're, we're, and goodbye. Good meeting, guys. Great meeting. Thank also, you, th thanks to, thanks to all of the financial people and people working on APD. Thank you. It's a big job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So thorough. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Britt. Great job. Thank you. Yes, great job. Thank you. Very clear. Adios. You might as well just log off because I'm closing the meeting here in T minus 20 seconds. 20.
Thanking. Thank you, Susan. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Bye, Diane Diaz. Four, three, two. Bye, Bruce. One, and then.